probably about five or six years ago on a forum that I manage on rodeotrickwriter.com that I met a gal that lives in Kansas who is looking for some trick writing advice. It seemed to me she was pretty isolated. I knew for a fact there was nobody in her state to teach trick writing to her, so we helped her out as much as we could online. And fast forward to just this last month, I offered to come out to Kansas and help her with her trick writing. I had been following Valerie on Facebook over the years and I grew fascinated with the pictures that she posted of her adventures of living on this large wheat farm that is a mile from the nearest neighbor in South Kansas and it's about three miles from the Oklahoma border. When I went back there I was really amazed on how remote they actually were. Their two kids have to entertain themselves. They have to use their imagination. They're not hooked to gadgets like the kids I see these days. They play outside, what a concept. They make things with their hands. It was really refreshing and I think this family could teach the rest of us a thing or two. Valerie and her husband Mike not only do all of their own work on their large farm, planting, harvesting, driving of the combines, hauling the wheat, they have also moved two very historic and significantly large buildings onto their property. One is the farmhouse in which they live and the other is a historic prairie schoolhouse that was built in the 1800s. And if that doesn't keep them busy enough, Mike also works for a short line railroad company just over the border in Oklahoma and he has purchased a locomotive of his own that he has completely rebuilt and he leases it back to the railroad. When Valerie took me up on my offer to come out and teach her trick writing, I had to bring along my camera gear because I knew there was a good story. It's a glimpse of hardworking people in the great vast prairie of the heartland of America and their dream to keep the history of the heartland alive. I'm Mike Brunheber and I live north of Caldwell, Kansas. My name is Valerie Brunheber. My husband and I live on a farm near Caldwell, Kansas. This farmhouse was kind of a whim. Uh, some people that we knew were parting it out. And at the time, my wife was looking for windows that would match a one-room school that we were attempting to work on. And I had a hunch about what house it is. And I thought, you know, I bet I've got an idea. They're gonna tear that dang house down. And I told them, I said, I'm going to call them up. I'd like to have the house rather than just to see them tear down a perfectly good old house. And so I did, and Valerie thought I was crazy, but they said, yeah, we'll sell the house. So we got this house pretty cheap. And kind of the rest is history. I made sure we could get it, get it over here across the river bridge and another creek bridge and so on. And drove out a possible route just to make sure it would fit down the roads and everything. And Sure enough, it did, so here we are. So that's how this got started. Uh, mobile homes don't last in the country. I mean, yeah, you, some folks might argue that, but I like these older houses. We could get a lot more out of this house than we ever could that mobile home we were living in. The kids needed a little more room. They needed a basement. And this is a plenty sturdy old house. It's got a lot of neat historic character to it. I figured it'd be a waste just to let it go. This has all the original woodwork uh, on the exterior and 
at least the two-story part of it. All the interior trim is intact. It's never been painted. It's much more ornate than a, than a normal country house is. So we lucked out with this. Now, the people that lived in this house for many generations took really good care of it. So by the time we got it, it had only been empty for about a year. We have moved the one room school to our prop, to our farm. At first we thought it could be a, you know, just a machine shed, tear out the floor. We needed something for our tractors and combines to go in. But once we got into the school and looked at it, the woodwork and the slate board, we just couldn't tear it up. So we decided to just move it to our farm and, and set it up as a one room school, restore it, put it back to the way it, way it was and do field trips or tours, things like that. Originally it had the really old, extremely old iron-sided desks like you see here. The last year of school was 1956. In these one-room schools they had anywhere from ages 5 through sometimes 21 or early 20s. I think that was more common in the 1800s, late 1800s or so because, you know, school was kind of a new thing and they didn't know anything and they were in their 20s, so they went to school to learn how to read and write. Well, they had a, they had a routine, of course, to do schoolwork. You know, the older, you know, they'd start with a certain age. I don't know if they start with the younger ones or what, but they would do one grade and that grade would come up and sit in this recitation bench at the front and they would do their work, you know, teacher would be teaching them at the chalkboard. And then when they were done, the teacher would send them back to their desk to do a project, you know, reading or whatever. They'd have them do, and so they'd send them back to their desk and they'd bring the next age, the next grade up, do the same thing, you know, whatever they're studying or working on. And then they would send them back with something to do, you know, and then bring the next, it was just, you know, they work through the grades and you know and while they were doing their homework if one of the younger ones was struggling with something the older ones were expected to help those younger ones. Miss Ellie May, do you need a paddling? That the dunce hat was something that was used for a while, and the student, the students that were naughty, they, the teacher would make them come up and sit and wear that, and all the other kids would have would laugh at them. So that was kind of a punishment. Don't be naughty, or you're going to get laughed at by your buddies. <laughs> Most of the one room schools, you don't know when they were built and the records were long gone lost. And so we're really, really lucky to have the records to the school. These were the cups that they used in this school. Each kid had a cup. Oops, there's that one's dusty. <laughs> and they would dip water. Of course, in, before they were sanitary, back in the old days, they just dipped their cup in there, but then they started realizing that that's bacteria, you know, from each person, so they used the, this thing to dip up the water and pour it in and get a drink and, you know.
Yes, I made this outfit, my first piece of clothing I ever made, but somehow it came out okay. It's not perfect, but what it's made to do, it's actually made from an 1880s pattern, and there's a spot back here where it lets down so that when you're riding side saddle on a horse, you don't show your ankles. But there's also weights in here. So when the wind's blowing and you're riding your horse, they don't go flying up because that was a big no-no if you could see your ankles or anything. <laughs> This is my house. This is my dining room. And my dining room happens to be what used to be a very old pioneer school. Back from around the 1870s, it was used as a school, we know for sure. There's a map that shows it on the 1878 map. And I don't know how long it was used, but you can see it had the very original black board surface. These are boards going across the room and they just painted it black and used that to ride on and whenever it got too rode up and couldn't race much they just paint it over, paint it black again. And they also had the blackboard surfaces between the windows as well. There's one right there. My husband put a example schedule. This dining room table set was my one of my grandmas, my grandma grew up at it, and my dad grew up at it, and I grew up at it, and now my kids are growing up at this table. This is the Spring Creek School, district number 36. It was built in 1904 and was closed down as a school in around 1947 or so. And right now it's <laughs> taken over by owls, barn owls. <laughs> it's gonna take, first of all, a move to next to our other school. Right here is just too, what, too much of a remote area that people like to vandalize it and mess with it. Obviously, we just found the door open today. Um, the windows, the windows are all gonna probably need to be rebuilt. The sashes, a lot of them are pretty well rotten, and roof obviously is really horrible. <laughs> it, the roof will have to, a lot of it be stripped off and new stuff put on. Hopefully, not too much lumber in the framework of it, but mostly old shingles and stuff ripped off and put new. OSB and the new shingles on that. It was 1947. It was stopped as being a school, but it turned into a community club called the Spring Creek Community Club. They have sold the buildings to us for a dollar. We just need to move them. <laughs> they have around 10,000 we can use, but we're finding out it's going to cost more than that probably to get it moved and get the roof all redone and the windows and new siding, and the wood stove that was in here was stolen, things like that. It, it's really had a lot of problems with vandalizing in this area. That's why it must be moved.
sounds like a river. Look at that. Let's see how much you get. I want to hold it off the roof. So it's been rained on so much. It, it's got to be clean. Really <laughs> and that sounds pretty tasty. I was there just for a few short days, but they were some pretty fabulous people, and I sure like to go back and visit them. Maybe they'll let me drive their combine at harvest time. That would be cool.